Today we are celebrating a really special Sunday in the life of our congregation. We are celebrating our anniversary of being 11 years a reconciling congregation. So we celebrate that. It's okay to clap if you want. (laughs) That means that we're celebrating the anniversary that um, leads to us on this ever-increasing journey of becoming more welcoming, more inclusive, and more justice-seeking, a journey which is a lifelong journey and a journey which we continue to want to grow and walk in. So as we celebrate this, um, we're going to be celebrating this by learning about Jacob's story in the Bible today um, as he seeks reconciliation with his brother Esau. So as we prepare our hearts for worship, I just invite us to a moment of peace, a moment of breathing, a moment of arriving and being present in this place um, and really putting ourselves in the love of God. And so let us prepare our hearts for worship this morning. My name is Abby. I'll be your worship leader today. Please stand as you're able um, and join with me in saying the opening prayer. We of many backgrounds and identities, personalities, and ideas gather collectively in shared pursuit of the sacred. Together, we make up the body of Christ. Wherever one of us is in pain, our whole body aches. Whenever one of us is cut off, the whole body is wounded. Whoever is kept away by discriminatory policies or practices or prejudices, our collective soul suffers the loss of their presence. We need one another in order to be whole. God, make us the body of Christ as you envisioned. May we become your presence enfleshed in service to the world and one another. Let us pray. God, we look for you all around us, but always. You are as close as our own breath. You linger in our very flesh. Forgive us for our struggles to remember your linger. Also, in the flesh of all our neighbors, the ones attacked, the ones policed, the ones condemned, the ones who are hungry, the ones turned away. In those we wound, you are wounded also. But when we honor the flesh of another, you are honored too. May it be so in us. Amen.
also, uh, today I brought a book to share with the congregation called A Church for All. And maybe you'll have a time after in our fellowship time to look through it, but I'll read you a part of it. So it's called Sunday Waking, Day is Breaking, Let's Go to Our Church for All, Church Bells Ringing, Joyful Noises, Choir Singing, Laughing Voices. Candles glowing, banners flowing, come enter our church for all. Weak and healthy, neat and messy, poor and wealthy, plain and dressy, all embracing, spirit gracing, each one at our church for all. Bodies wiggling, mommies reading, children giggling, daddies pleading, Toddlers flailing, babies wailing. There's room at our church for all. Hands receiving, hands connecting, hearts believing, hearts accepting. Feel the spirit. Can you hear it? It's here at our church for all. First, please stand as you're able and join with me in reading the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture is found in Genesis 32, verses 22 to 31. You can find it in the Old Testament on page 30 in the Bible. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you asked my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God.
and join with me in a moment of prayer. Holy Spirit, you breathe and move and live within us. So we ask this morning that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I wonder if any of you are familiar with Mexican luchadores. Anybody know about Mexican luchadores? Okay, at least we got one in here, right? Anybody else? No, no, no. Okay, they're Mexican freestyle wrestlers. You may have seen them because they often wear very colorful masks and they have personas and they have names and um, it's a huge part of Mexican culture. My, uh, I am not an authority on this, but my Mexican husband does know a few things about this, and he tells me that the luchadores, the fighters, are divided between two main camps, the good guys and the bad guys, called the technicos, the, exper the experts who abide by the rules, and the rudos, the bad guys, those who break the rules. Now, the good guys battle by following the rules. They often listen to the ref, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the bad guys will cheat and will do anything to win, even get the ref in their pocket. Now, this is a very simplified version. Uh, you can ask my husband, Daniel, to explain you more. Um, but that is, that's what I understand, at least. All of them, of course, have their own personas and colorful masks, and at some point uh, there were mysteries around uh, the masks and whether you would actually get to ever see the face of the wrestler. Um, I believe that one of the most famous wrestlers was even buried in his mask um, so that you never saw his face. I've been told that wrestling here is not so much a sport as a spectacle. And if you want to understand Mexican politics, you have to begin to watch Lucha Libre. Our scripture for today made me think of the Mexican luchadores because it's a story of a wrestling match between Jacob and God, but also because if you look more deeply at Jacob's story, you aren't quite sure whether he's one of the good guys, los técnicos, or whether he's one of the bad guys, los rudos. Because for a long time, he cheated his way into a place of prominence in the history of the people of Israel. You are probably familiar with Jacob's backstory, but it's quite important to understand it and understanding the story for today. So bear with me as I re recount a little bit of his background. Jacob and his twin brother Esau have a long-standing fraught relationship. It was so long-standing, it actually began in the womb when the two babies struggled within Rebecca's womb. They struggled so much that she prayed and asked God why this was happening to her. And so the Lord told her that two different nations were in her womb and the two peoples from within her would be separated. Esau was born first red and hairy, and then Jacob came out grasping Esau's heel. Names were important, not just in this passage, but culturally and socially at the time, connecting people to their ancestors, their heritage, and giving them a reputation. Jacob's name, therefore, tells us a lot about him. Jacob means he takes by the heel. Some people translate that as he supplants. And this is who he became, a trickster, one who connives and schemes, one who deceives. He doesn't hesitate to cheat, to cheat to achieve what he wants in life. He first gets that by, gets Esau's birthright, the inheritance given to the firstborn son. And then he even cheats Esau out of his dying father's special blessing. This is the last straw for Esau, you can imagine, and it made Esau hate Jacob and vow to kill him the moment that their father died. Being warned of Jacob's vow by his mother, Jacob then ran for his life. He went to his maternal grandfather Laban's house and land, and there he went to marry and make a living until Esau cooled off. However, he continued his conniving ways there, increasing his assets in dubious ways. Eventually, he wore out his welcome, or he wanted to return home to his family, and 
with his family and extensive wealth, he sent word to Esau that he was coming back home. The messenger that he sent returned back to Jacob, saying that Esau was on his way to meet him with 400 men. And Jacob became afraid. He sent everyone ahead of him across the river, and he spent that last night alone on the other side of the riverbank, praying to God for deliverance. Filled with fear and dread, Jacob was greatly distressed. He didn't know whether the next day would bring his death or reconciliation with his brother. That night on the riverbank, God's deliverance came in the form of an angel and a wrestling match. And somehow, in the wrestling match, Jacob experiences transformation and healing along with a blessing and a disability. Jacob wrestled with this mysterious angel whom he believes is God all night long, and he will not let God go. When the divine wrestler could not win against Jacob, the angel struck him in the hip socket, and in the language of today, Jacob becomes disabled. For the rest of his life, he will walk with a limp. Still, Jacob does not release the mysterious divine wrestler. Then the angel said, let me go for day is breaking. Humans were not allowed to see the face of God and live, but Jacob is willing to risk his life and refuses to let this divine wrestler go until this wrestler blesses him. At this point, God asks Jacob for his name and gives him a new name, Israel. This new name, Israel, means both God strives and God struggles and one who strives or struggles with God. Amy Kenny, in her book, My Body is Not a Prayer Request, writes about this passage in her chapter called Disability Blessings. This week, we're going to actually begin studying this book together on Zoom, and so I thought we'd let her voice speak to all of us for a few moments here. She writes about Jacob's story and this wrestling match. Two changes occur here, the name change and the physical change, and both are signs of God's blessing to Jacob and marks of the covenant. The disability is not a mark of weakness or punishment in the passage. The new name and new limp are signs of his blessing and covenant with God. The limp is, in fact, a badge of Jacob's strength and unrelenting determination, a reminder that he fought, persevered, and would not let go all night long. The limp is a sign of the prophetic witness that God invites wrestling to create transformation. She goes on to write, The struggle becomes his new identity, one who strives with God instead of trying to outpace God. In this wrestling match, Jacob's perspective changes. Instead of cheating and conniving, he desires deliverance. As Kenny writes, the wrestling match disables Jacob and produces the first sign of his transformative healing in the narrative, a dislocated hip. In the next chapter, Jacob becomes repentant, weeping, and generous in his reunion with Esau, offering Esau all the property that once was so precious to him. He even says to Esau that he is an image bearer of God telling him in their moment of reunion and reconciliation in Genesis chapter 33, I have seen your face like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. As we celebrate our 11th anniversary of becoming a reconciling congregation, we do so with this scripture of Jacob on the eve of his reconciliation with his brother. And yet, Jacob did not know, again, whether the next day would bring him death, or reconciliation. I think there's something to learn here about reconciliation. What's at stake? What it costs? What you risk? What needs to be transformed to even attempt reconciliation? But first, before there is even the possibility of reconciliation, there is the wrestling. Life is not black and white. Though there are some clear right and wrongs in life, very quickly we move into gray territory, which I like to call the wrestling ring. And in that ring, we have to struggle 
to wrestle with questions about life. And it's an ongoing thing. I find myself in the wrestling ring over and over and over again in life, and it will never be over. I think that's so important for us to hear as a reconciling congregation. To be a reconciling congregation means to be one that is committed to the wrestling, one that stays in the struggle, that doesn't let go, that strives with God, with oneself, with one's beliefs, with one's actions and past, with others. It is to be one with unrelenting determination to the core ideal of celebrating God's gift of diversity and valuing the wholeness that is made possible in community equally shared and shepherded by all. Second, the wrestling changes you and gives you a new identity. Even if it doesn't resolve everything entirely, you are transformed in the wrestling. Your former opinions and your ways of thinking and operating are undone. Perhaps you are even wounded or disabled in this wrestling process, a wound or a disability that remains with you as a sign of your transformation. One thing that I love about this story is that the meaning for the name Israel is in present and active tense. It means one It means one who contends with God, one who struggles with God, one who strives with God. And it's an active, ongoing, and future thing. It means our wrestling is never over. Our conversion and our transformation is ongoing. I think we can see that in the tension, just in how Jacob is named going forward in Scripture. Sometimes he is still called Jacob, and sometimes he is Israel. He will continue becoming Israel throughout the rest of his life. And the third point in this transformation is that the wrestling puts you on a path to embrace the world in a different way, to see the world differently, to live and move and engage within the world in a different way, It means to be people who can say of one another and of all whom we encounter, to see your face is to see the face of God, to see the ways that others bear God's image, just as Jacob did with Esau. That is the work of that is the work of true reconciliation and justice laid out for us, this ever unfolding path of living in the world differently than before, as one who has been transformed and become new. We don't necessarily see this part in the struggle with Jacob and the story of Jacob, but reconciliation truly is an ongoing process. It is never settled. It is an enlargement of our hearts to love the way that God loves, and there is always room for us to grow in that. In our United Methodist Reconciling Statement that was given to you today, you'll notice that Reconciling Ministries is not just engaged in the inclusion and justice of, of, with, and for LGBTQ folks. It is about the inclusion of all marginalized people. The final sentence of the pledge reads, As followers of Jesus, we commit ourselves to the pursuit of justice and pledge to stand in solidarity with all who are marginalized and oppressed. The challenge is to keep this story, this pledge, this commitment ever before us. I'm sure that was a challenge for Jacob and his descendants as well, And yet the story in our scripture today becomes a formative and foundational story for the people. As Jacob becomes and is becoming Israel, the people eventually become Israel as well. The people, Israel, the 12 tribes, Israel, the nation, the kingdom. Of all the stories in scripture and all the names in scripture, this is the story that is remembered as Jacob the luchador becomes Israel. You might say, moving from a luchador rudo to a luchador tecnico, this name becomes the name for an entire people and a sign of their covenant with God. This is how the people want to be named and remembered as ones who struggle with God. Later generations remember this encounter in a way we might even consider sacramental. Now, it's not by what we know as communion, eating the bread and the wine, but as Amy Kenny points out in her book, it's by refraining from eating the sinew of the thigh muscle when consuming meat. What's interesting is that this refraining of eating at that particular place in the meat was not a law that was ever prescribed to them among all the dietary codes that you can find in the Old Testament. 
This is something different. This is something that the people choose to do, an act of remembrance to participate in this covenant and in this covenant-making moment with their disabled leader. Every time an animal was butchered, they were reminded of Jacob's disability through this practice, and it was a blessing. It institutionalized the memory of Jacob's wrestling match, ensuring that the people of Israel will continue to remember this struggle. Even more good news, the name Israel, let me remind us, doesn't just mean one who strives with God. It also means God strives, God struggles. That means that Jacob isn't the only one impacted by this divine wrestling match. God was also impacted. This name affirms God's commitment to stay with Jacob in the struggle, and later God's commitment, God's covenant, to stay with the people Israel in their struggle. God will be caught up in this relationship between humanity and God, and God promises to be an actively engaged partner, one who struggles with us, one who allows themselves to be caught by us, a God who makes a covenant with us, and a God who is a God of blessing. Eleven years ago, the people of University United Methodist Church made a covenant with one another and with God. This covenant did not mean refraining from eating the sinews of a hip socket, but it was a covenant to be and to become a reconciling congregation. We made a covenant that was meant to be remembered and institutionalized, a covenant born out of the wrestling of the people, a covenant to continue struggling and wrestling together. We took on a new identity in the process, an identity that was transformative and healing, an identity that was meant to undo some of the harm we may have perpetrated and a harm that undeniably has been perpetrated by the church. An identity that put us on a path to embrace the world in a different way, in a new way, and to live out our faith in the world in a different way and a new way, and to engage in the world in a different way and in a new way. To look at one another, marginalized and oppressed, privileged and powerful, and to see the face of God in one another, and to let that lead us on into the work of reconciliation and justice, a work that is ongoing and ever unfolding. I give thanks for this work that led to that moment 11 years ago, and I invite us to carry this covenant with us and forward with us, this promise that we have made for the work of struggle, la lucha, and the work of reconciliation is not yet done. So I invite us today, as we close this time of word, to recommit ourselves to that covenant. And so I invite you to take the card that was given to you and to stand or sit in whatever posture is most comfortable to you as you reaffirm this and to read this commitment that we have made together as a church with me. It's on this postcard that was given to you. Yep. For those who would like to stand, I invite you to stand now. Together, let us reaffirm our commitment. We celebrate God's gift of diversity and value the wholeness made possible in community equally shared and shepherded by all. We welcome and affirm people of every gender identity gender expression, and sexual orientation, who are also of every age, race, ethnicity, physical and mental ability, level of education, and family structure, and of every economic, immigration, marital, and social status, and so much more. We acknowledge that we live in a world of profound social, economic, and political inequities, as followers of Jesus, we commit ourselves to the pursuit of justice and pledge to stand in solidarity with all who are marginalized and oppressed. Amen. May it be so. Please be seated.
Lord, hear our prayer. God, we come saying thank you for this reconciling church called University United Methodist Church. Thank you for how you've blessed us throughout the years, Lord, and where we can improve upon. God, we continue to allow us to be opened in new ways, Lord, to receive the diverse congregation that you have placed before us, O oh Lord. May we be receptive to seeing those that are different from us, Lord. May we be receptive to seeing how we have failed and understand how we can improve upon being a more welcoming church. God, we thank you for how you've allowed us to realize that there is much work to be done, not only here at university, but in this world. And we ask that we would turn our hands, our hearts, our ears over to you, that you would direct everything that we do, that all of it would be pleasing in your eyesight, O oh God. To each and every one of us individually and collectively, Lord, those that have uh, burdens and cares and wants and needs and desires, Lord, may we place them here at the altar for you to handle, God, and may we leave it here in your hands, not picking it back up to take it back with us, not stressing over it, not worrying, God, but truly knowing that it is all in your hands. For we shall pray about everything and worry about nothing, O oh God. Thank you, God, for how you've allowed us to be used by you to bring honor and glory unto you. Continue to bless us through this week, God. Watch over us and care for us. We pray for every prayer request that's been lifted up, Lord, those within our hearts, those that have been written down, those within our minds, God. Bring those to the forefront right now, God, as we think about those that are in need, those cares and worries that are at the forefront, God. May we put them here now before you. God, we thank you for answering our prayers, Lord, for touching Elma in Florida, for touching our children, oh God, for touching those going through divorce, God, touching those that are in incarcerated, God, for touching those, Lord, that uh, we are trying to reach out to, but we cannot seem to contact, Lord, continue to mend broken relationships, lift burdens, God, heal heavy hearts, give us safe traveling passage, Watch over us as we go on the highways, byways, and airways, O oh Lord. Touch those that are not here, Lord, and be with each and every one of us. We turn it all over to you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, would be thy name. Amen.
invite you to be seated for one moment. And I want to share with you a few opportunities uh, for serving and for connecting this week. You'll see in our announcements in the bulletin a few of these listed, but uh, one is to spice up your life um, and the lives of some college students. You'll see we have a basket for spices. Um, we visited the food pantry at the campus of the University of Maryland uh, in the last few months, and 20% uh, of their population is food insecure. And one of the things that they don't receive often from different places that where they receive the food to distribute is spices. And so we're doing a little spice drive for them, uh, and we're asking for cinnamon at this time, and we'll kind of be changing different spices throughout the year. So if you can spare or buy a, a, a jar of cinnamon spice, we would invite you to do that and bring it and leave it here in the sanctuary one of the times that you come for worship. I also just want to remind us that this book study, and this is the book that I quoted from a little bit this morning by Amy Kinney, My Body is Not a Prayer Request, Disability Justice in the Church. We are going to be doing a book study for it of it for the next five Wednesday nights, um, beginning this Wednesday at six, a little bit earlier than normal because we have our charge conference later that night. Um, but the rest of the Wednesdays will be at 630 it will be on Zoom, so anybody who would like uh, to attend uh, is welcome. We'll send out the Zoom link earlier that day. Um, you don't have to have finished the chapters this week, but we do invite you, if you have the book or you can buy it on um, Kindle or, or borrow it from the library, I actually saw that it was available at my library, um, to read chapter one and two for this Wednesday nights. 
Also, we have opportunities for a fellowship. We're trying to create fellowship time again post-COVID and experiment with that. And so right now our experiment is our hospitality table, which is found in the long hallway towards the end of the hallway outside of our parlor, which has plenty of seating area, um, also can flow into the gym or stay in the hallway or be outside. So it's a very simple table just with um, uh, maybe two different kinds of items and some drinks. Uh, so we invite you to stay and partake of that today. We also invite you, if, if you would like to host that table, there's a sign-up sheet on the table and it shares kind of what, what we recommend in terms of keeping it simple um, and, um, and how to provide a little bit of hospitality for after our worship services. So if you are um, feeling inclined to serve in that way, we would invite you to take a look at the Sundays um, and sign up for one um, and regardless of that, we hope you stay and partake of some of the food and refreshment today. Also, uh, the coming out this week, we will be having another football game next Saturday. Um, I know that the sign-up sheet for helping um, with our parking lot tailgating and cars has already gone out, but we are in need of uh, volunteers greatly for this coming Saturday from around the time of 9 a.m. till 3.30, and they're broken up into chunks, and whatever you could come and serve during that time, um, take money, help cars park, um, enjoy the fun atmosphere in our property and, and our lot, we would invite you to do that. And if you're ever not able to be here in worship physically, uh, we have begun, as you've noticed probably for the last several weeks, a live stream on our YouTube channel. And so if you're sick and you really want to join, but you feel sick and you shouldn't come, you should join us via YouTube. Um, and that is available live on Sunday mornings. And then we do a little bit of editing and put that basically on our website uh, by Monday or Tuesday. Um, Monday afternoon or Tuesday. I think that's everything for this Sunday. So I invite us uh, to stand as you are led once again and, and sing together our closing hymn, Bind Us Together in the Black Thin Hymnal. May the God of peace, joy, and reconciliation be upon us now, both henceforth and for more evermore. And all the people of God said, Amen. <laughs>